In this recording, I want to talk about uh, suctioning as far as hazards and complications, the technique, and ways to minimize those complications. Suctioning is inherently dangerous, so we need to kind of pay attention. You see the list of hazards and complications of suctioning on the left here where you have decreased compliance in FRC, you have atelectasis, hypoxia or hypoxemia, trauma to the tissue, bronchospasm, cross-contamination, hypertension, hypotension, and cardiac arrhythmias. That's just for the suctioning. So it's it's inherently dangerous, okay? But if we stay on top of things, they, they, this stuff shouldn't be a problem if things are done right, all right? Um, we used to, uh, do some normal saline installation into an artificial airway and we still do on occasion but it's not routine but uh, the best best way I can describe this is I know you've all had drank a tea a drink of tea or soda or milk or something that goes down the wrong pipe well that's what this is and, and we're doing this on purpose you know you cough and you hack and your eyes water and you and you can't talk for a few minutes Okay, that's what this feels like when you do the normal saline installation. Well, in addition, you know, you may have some uh, hypoxemia, some bronchospasms. Cross-contamination is the issue that uh, we don't do that anymore, or with less frequency now. Pain, anxiety, dyspnea, tachycardia, and increased ICP, intracranial pressure, due to all that coughing. I want to go back over here for just a second about the cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, when we're uh, in ICU, we're going to have all kinds of monitors going on, and this is kind of an idea that we're going to have. Input. More input. So we're going to need to pay attention to these things, right? And uh, so while we're while we're performing the suctioning, okay, we need to be looking at these monitors. And so if we're seeing rhythms like this, okay, uh, we probably need to stop what we're doing and give them some extra oxygen. So pay attention to those monitors. They're there for a reason. Um, So the um, technique itself is, uh, first First of all, we're only going to do this when it's required. So we're we're going to assess them all the time, but uh, we're only going to suction when our assessment indicates that. So abnormal breath sound suggests the need for, for suctioning. Now, when you have somebody on a ventilator, very seldom are you going to hear clear breath sounds. Okay, so you also have to uh, factor in the account of how many secretions am I getting out of them. Okay, so, but never to a, a preset schedule. Okay, it's determined by your assessment. Now, one thing that that we do do here on, on the bottom of the list here is, and and I do this routinely when I when I first encounter the patient with an artificial airway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass that suction catheter to make sure that tube's clean. So make sure that tube is patent. And so um, this, this is whether they have good or bad or whatever breath sounds. This is just to determine that the tube is open and it's clean and it's, it's not partially occluded or completely occluded for, for whatever reason. And so that's just something that I do routinely. So we're going to assemble and check our equipment, adjust it to the right settings, right? We're going to hyperoxygenate the patient. The rule of thumb here is two minutes before, two minutes during, and two minutes after. Something like that. And we're going to use 100% 100, 100 oxygen or as much oxygen as we can get our hands on. All right. If, you have, if you're using a ventilator, they typically have a 100% uh, uh, suction key of some sort that you can engage that'll last for you know, the 100% will last for two or three minutes and then automatically revert to the original setting. So uh, in some most cases, that's plenty. In some cases, you may have to run that 
100% for two or three different times before you, the patient recovers or before you get them oxygenated to the point where you're ready to suction. But, but pay attention to their saturation and make sure their saturation is okay bef before, during, and after the technique. So you insert the catheter, you apply the suction catheter. So as you insert the catheter, you're going to move it all the way down until you hit a resistance. And that resistance is going to be the carina. Right? And so as you touch that carina, the patient will cough unless they're sedated to, to the point of paralysis or paralyzed. Um, and we want them to cough. All right? Now, I don't have to be real aggressive here with this, uh, this catheter and making them cough because just the slightest stimulus will make them cough. And you know, especially if you're doing this six or eight times a day, they're probably pretty irritated anyway, and it's very easy for them to get to get them to cough. So just a, a slight touch of the carina, and then you're going to pull back on that suction catheter uh, slightly just to get it off of the tissue before you apply the suction. All right. Now at this point, we once we start applying the suction, we're, we have 15 seconds, all right, to get our business done. All right, and that. That includes uh, gets secretion suctioned out and uh, removing the catheter from the airway. After after that, we reoxygenate the patient, and then we reassess. Now it may be that we have to make multiple passes while suctioning the patient. Um, that's determined by our stethoscope. You know what do we hear? What's going on? If we had a adverse events, okay. If we have um, that vagal nerve stimulation. Um, you know, the vagal nerve, even though it wasn't on our previous list, anytime you, you stimulate that vagal nerve, vital signs go south. And so, and the, the eyes roll back. That's the way you'll see that probably initially as the eyes roll back if they were awake to begin with. And uh, so then you stop and give them extra oxygen, give them some stimulus. And then, um, Reevaluate. So the reason that I that I uh, mentioned those complications at at the very first of this presentation is because knowing those presentations, you have to know the, what those are to be able to minimize their effect. All right, and so um, that's the reason for that. So how do we minimize hypoxemia? Well, the idea is you treat hypoxemia with with oxygen, you also prevent hypoxemia with oxygen, right? So that's kind of the way this is working. So pre-oxygenation helps minimize the incidence of hypoxemia. The atelectasis is avoided by limiting the negative pressure, right? Um, the, the negative pressure used. So here's an idea of the, of the pressures and the size of the patient that's used on the adults, 100 to 120. The children, 80 to 100, and infants from 60 to 80 tor. So again, you're going to adjust your your regulator to this pressure. A another instance of suction that you might see in the nursery or the delivery room is, is a suction bulb that you'd use on neonates. Now this doesn't suction out the lungs, uh, but we use it quite a bit to suction out the mouth and the nose, which is commonly a problem in, in the neonates. So that's just a, another option there. Okay, uh, so keeping duration of suctioning as short as possible, in other words, 15 seconds or less, using the appropriate suction catheter size. Here's an example of, of how to determine the correct size. Now, the, the issue here is the units on the endotracheal tube are millimeters. And for the, the suction catheters, it's French. And so converting between them is what causes uh, the issue here. But uh, one example here is um, if you have a, a size 8 ET tube, that's 8 millimeters for the ET tube, then uh, you take and multiply that times 3, which gives you 24. Then if you divide that by two, it gives you 12. And so then the next larger size, that's, so this is what you would choose. This is the way you choose that. It's the next larger size. Okay. 
and so that would be a 14 French suction catheter and you, and you read that off of the packaging when you when you unpackage it now the, the reason we're concerned about the size of the suction catheter is because uh, we want to we want to be able to breathe around it we want to be able to ventilate around it oxygenate and if if you uh, you know if you have that airway plugged up you're going to cause atelectasis uh, much more quickly than if if you if you don't have it plugged up so um, this is more so for the NBRC type idea. In the hospital, we typically are limited to what they have supplied, and that is to, in, usually a 14 French. Uh, if, if you have other requirements, like if you have a smaller adult that has a smaller size in the tracheal tube, like a 5 or a 6, well, now that 14 won't even fit in there. So you'd have to just request a smaller size. Uh, six or eight or ten something like that all right and avoid disconnection from the ventilator very Im important concept okay. um, before the uh, the uh, 24 hour suction catheters uh, came about you know we used the sterile technique on everyone and so we had to dis disconnect them and bag them with a bag and suction them like that. So avoiding this disconnection uh, helps in a number of ways. Okay, it prevents a hypoxemia, all right, and, and they don't lose their pressure from the ventilator, and they don't lose their, their oxygenation and their ventilation while this is going on. So that, that's a big, uh, that's big improvement from what it used to be. Um, and then set the suction pressure as low as possible. Okay, and remember that while you're while you're applying the suction down the airway, that it's uh, sucking their volume out of their lungs. So uh, lowest possible pressure and the lowest amount of time required is important. So here's those rule of thumbs: the maximum time inside the airway is 15 seconds, right? Maximum suction pressure according to the patient for adults that's 120 and then the size of the cath catheter probably more important at the NBRC than it is you know down the street. Another thing here is, is the vagal stimulation. All right, you actually have to have the suction catheter on top of the anatomy for that to occur so while it is inside the airway you don't have that problem so what, when this is going to occur is when you have this uh, suction catheter advanced all the way to the end of the endotracheal tube and it's dangling out the, the far end, that's when you're going to get that problem. So that's when you need to pay attention to those monitors. You want to make sure that you use sterile technique and, and so that, that also includes when you're changing the suction catheter out. Uh, when you're taking the old one off and putting the new one on. You want to make sure that you keep it clean. So don't lay it down on the bed or, or on top of the patient, anything like that. Don't contaminate it because that's where the bacteria grow if that happens. And then do not routinely instill uh, the normal saline into the airway. Again, because of that, uh, you know, the, what happens is the bacteria colonize the airway and if you wash the saline into the, into the airway, then it uh, it'll it'll wash those that colony of bacteria down into the lungs, and that's one of the causes of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So we don't do that routinely. So what we covered here is we covered the indications for suctioning, the complications and hazards, the technique, and also how to minimize those complications and hazards.